Does this work? Yes. Okay. Um, I won't bother you much with uh, motivating use cases. You've seen plenty of that today. I just want to point out that this Omnivision, which is a company that's making image sensors for consumer markets primarily, we are focusing on really applications that are enhancing, uh, right now enhancing um, image sensor uh, perception. And we're looking at uh, potential applications that can be deployed in, in consumer markets as well, such as deep blur, uh, slow motion capture. And we hope that there will also be more progress in, in other use cases like SLAM, or for which, for instance, David's group is studying uh, combining EVS and, and intensity frames more intensively. Yeah. Um, so what we are looking into is a hybrid camera approach. We presented this at ISSCC uh, earlier this year. We have an extended paper upcoming in uh, JSSC uh, journal. Um, compared to a dual camera approach, it has the advantage that we solve synchronization on chip and we don't have baseline or parallax error. Also, we need only one lens and uh, one package, so it reduces cost and size. We do this by implementing wafer-level stacking technology. We actually have a free wafer stack set up. Um, for, to achieve a small footprint, and we have a high-speed readout circuit, and all of that was detailed in the conference. I'll touch upon it here. This is a cross-section of our free wafer stacking process. You can see on the left-hand side, well, that image. The top wafer is really for the pixel devices. We, uh, there are micro lenses and color filters and uh, deep trench isolation. The top wafer connects to the middle wafer using stack pixel level connections. On the middle wafer, we have basically all the EVS pixel readout circuitry connecting to the bottom wafer using backside TSVs uh, where we have all the peripheral circuits. And you can see how those three wafers are allocated in the right hand part of the image, right? Pixel to the left, middle wafer with EVS pixel and periphery like ADCs, EVS readout circuit and so on to the right. The pixel wafer incorporates pin photodiodes because we care a lot about image quality and we use the same photodiodes also for the EVS pixel. We just operate it as a static bias. The EVS pixels connect uh, on a cluster of 4x4 pixels to the middle wafer. You can see on the bottom part there is a color filter array, right, RGB for your normal CIS uh, channel and then one of these uh, pixels um, has a clear color filter and connects to the middle wafer for EVS function. So you see that the EVS pixel is actually wrapped behind this 4x4 cluster of pixels. Um, the, EV, um, the CIS pixel connects to the column bus and, is, uh, bus and is connected to the peripheral circuit at the edge of the sensor. Um, here you can see a uh, simplified schematic of our pixel uh, circuit. It's pretty conventional. Um, a photo die to the left, logarithmic amplifier, um, a buffer to prevent from kickback, um, difference detector, comparators, and then a bit keeper. Um, so far, so good. We do further implement a time to digital converter. In the past, we have at this conference presented Shushun. Uh, Shen, um, the former CEO, CTO of uh, Cellapixel, who is now Omnivision, has presented a time-to-analog converter. We are now uh, using a time-to-digital converter, so we don't have to use extra space for ADCs. Uh, we use a programmable resistor in this feedback path of the uh, difference detector that's basically acting as a high-pass filter. The pixel itself already forms a low-pass filter, so basically we can achieve band-pass filter characteristic, and this can also be interesting for Flickr. We do sum up all the photo current of all the pixels on a supply and measure the current. This basically acts as a global ambient light monitor signal. This can be used again to derive information of how the pixel is operated and you can use it to tune parameters. And we also actually uh, generate an activity monitor signal. So basically we do this by um, operating this or implementing this um, this latch in such a way that one of these cross-coupled inverters is current starved. So if there is no event, there is no current from the supply. If there's an event, there's a specific current, we sum them all up and then we basically have a global activity signal that basically gives an indication of how many events you still have to read out. And you can use this for tuning, filters, uh, readout circuit and so on. This is a high-level view on the sensor. Again, there's much more detail in the uh, ISCC paper and upcoming uh, JSSC paper. Um, we have the pixel array here in gray. We have readout scanner uh, at the left and at the bottom. Um, we have a scanning circuit. It's not arbitration, but we do implement the scanner such that if, there, if the row does not have a read request, we skip over the row in a fraction of a, of a clock cycle. We don't spend clock cycles on rows that, or columns that don't have events. So we, we still read out sparse. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much 
the high-level view on the sensor. And we also outline several strategies to deal with flicker. When you talk about flicker, actually you have to separate what sources of flicker do exist. Um, fluorescent light is basically um, a flicker source where you have a, a light ripple voltage uh, on, on your or a ripple uh, photonic flux. Um, then actually you can adjust the contrast threshold as the former presenter has presented. But if you have other sources of flicker like um, LED um, uh, pulse or, or uh, pulse width modulation, of course your temporal contrast is so high that this doesn't help you anymore. You basically lose any sensitivity to signal. Um, one-time events like flash can be uh, dealt with if you reset the whole uh, array at once. Again, then the activity monitor can be really helpful to know, okay, so uh, we have 90% uh, of the pixels fired. Let, let's just reset the sensor. Um, we can uh, do region of interest and subsample, uh, and we um, implement a mode where the subsampling is randomized so you don't always subsample the same pattern. And if you do fusion, for instance, for deeper and so on, this does matter because you might see some artifacts if you always subsample the same pixel. And again, I talked about the bandpass filter. This is really implemented in analog in the pixel. So here you can see some images taken from the sensor. You see a 1080p image on the left, 120 FPS. You see the corresponding uh, aggregated EVS frame on the right-hand side. We have some rolling shutter correction videos here. Um, you, yeah. And here you can see the same at longer exposure where you see blur. And again, EVS can help you to mitigate this. Um, so this is, by the way, um, I talked about at the beginning that we have this 4x4 four four array of CIS pixels corresponding to one EVS pixel. These images are in 1080p, so actually this is binned. So now you have basically one EVS pixel and then RGGB. Yeah, and here you have a slow motion video. So we interpolate basically from 120 FPS using events up to almost 8 kilo frame per second. With the GNN? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is one part of the talk. The next part of the talk is how do we actually develop these algorithms. In order to develop algorithms, we uh, use end-to-end -end training. So we need high-speed reference data. We capture the reference data using a high-speed camera. And we use a simulator to synthesize frames and events with a blur, rolling shutter artifacts, and all of that. Um, given that we make the sensors, we know pretty well in detail what, what is inside those sensors, so we make our own custom simulators. So we had uh, two publications on the simulators that are cited here at the bottom of the slide, one at EI and one at ISW. Um, the EI paper focused more on how we generate from the frames the photocurrent maps uh, and then how we do all the readout parts so that we correspond, uh, that we um, model the scan latency effort, but where current simulators mostly do not cover scan latency. Um, the ISW paper talked more about an accurate pixel of itself. So the way that we do this is we use ordinary differential equations to model the, the pixel circuit, and we use autoregressive noise models using Monte Carlo to generate random paths that match the desired autocorrelation functions. And of course, they match the uh, models. And I won't bore you with math, but if, you want, if you're interested in the math, all of that is given in the ISW paper. You can see here some sample paths. And what was interesting to see is that um, if you increase the um, scene contrast above the contrast threshold, um, the time point at which you get an event, if you don't have any noise or if you have noise, they kind of converge to the same point. Basically, that means that if you just have enough contrast, um, you can actually um, use this noise, a noise-free model for which we actually found an analytical uh, solution to estimate parameters. So you can do... Um, model parameter for search using an optimization approach. And uh, we also found a goodness of fit indicator because in the end, if you measure, the only thing you can really observe are events, event probabilities, and event timestamps. Um, event probabilities, well, in, if you have a high contrast, the probability of firing is almost close to one. So this, it's not really good as an indicator to sort out which events are useless for fitting. But the jitter is actually still a very good uh, indicator, it turns out. So we plot here normalized uh, jitter to the median value. And you can see it linearly correlates almost um, at least for, for high enough contrast with the, um, with the error between noise-free and noise-affected timestamps for difference. Here you can see some reconstructed, um, so some modeled um, S-curves on the right-hand side and some measured S-curves on the left-hand side from that sensor that we presented. 
and here you can see some latency curves. So we have pretty good correspondence with actual physical measurements. And we use that basically to generate algorithms. Okay, so in summary, uh, we use advanced stacking technology uh, to realize hybrid EVS CIS sensors. Um, using a, a hybrid sensor um, avoids synchronization issues, avoids parallax. We need only one lens, one package. So we basically don't, uh, we, we reduce cost. Um, we do look at several use cases such as deep blur, slow motion, slam could be interesting in the future. Um, we uh, employ um, low latency readout uh, that is scene driven, so basically we skip over rows or columns that don't have events. Um, we achieve uh, decent performance in noise uh, readout and power. And I want to point out here that again, a synthesis of uh, realistic ground truth uh, data is important, which is why we work on simulators as well. Thank you.